This morning we look at Isaiah chapter 61 verses 1, 2, and 3, verse 10 and 11. As we ask the question, what do you want for Christmas? Do you want what the world offers or do you want what Christ offers? He comes in grace, he comes in judgment. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text today is uh, from Isaiah chapter 61 as we hear the, about the year of the Lord's favor. I'll begin with verses 1, 2, and 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. The text and the tone of this portion of Isaiah seems to recall to us once again the captivity in Babylon. The people that God had rebuked who were hard-hearted and unrepentant and whom he had to forcibly remove from his holy land and his holy city and send far away across the desert to a strange place. There they lived for 70 years of captivity. Captivity in which they were unable to go to Jerusalem, in which they were in sorrow and despair because all that was familiar to them, all that they knew, even the temple itself, had been torn down. Their hope in God, their hope that they would return, all hope seemed to be gone, and they were in great sorrow. But Isaiah is not only talking about Babylon. This imagery of the Babylonian captivity is simply a bit of a foretaste, is a type of the salvation that God would bring. The type of salvation that he had brought to his people before in years past. As he came to the aid of Abraham, as he came to the aid of his children in Egypt and brought them home again. God would send his servant. And this is about the servant of the Lord. You know, we are all in captivity, really, aren't we, spiritually? At least we're born into captivity, shackled and chained, prisoners, people who stand in the darkness, people who are locked away, despairing and brokenhearted. If we think about probably one of the more familiar seasonal novels written by Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. I think even though it, uh, it seems to portray a variety of things in the salvation of one man's soul, there's something particularly interesting at the beginning of it as the spirit of his partner Marley arrives and begins the whole process of bringing God's word to, uh, to Scrooge. Scrooge says to Marley, you're fettered, he said trembling. Tell me why. Marley answered, I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will and my, of my own free will I wear it. Or would you know the weight and length of the strong coil that you bear yourself? It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You have labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Might well describe the chains that we ourselves are bound in. From the original sin that we are guilty of at birth to the actual sins that we do day in and day out, the natural person within us, we call that the old Adam, struggles in his rebellion against God. The desire to be God himself and to overcome God, to shut God out of his life. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that 
The wages of sin is death, physical death, eternal death, spiritual death. But he also tells us that the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. People in this world are locked in the chains of sin and death. You and I no longer because we have been set free. But many around us, friends, neighbors, perhaps family, are themselves bound in those chains. This morning, Jesus speaks these words in Isaiah Psalm 61, shortly after his baptism at the Jordan River by John the baptizer. As he comes back from his temptation in the wilderness and goes into Galilee, and there back home to the city of Nazareth, he's asked to speak in the synagogue. And there is presented before him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he unrolls it until he comes to this part. And he reads these words to his people. And he says to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. People today really don't want to hear that, do they? People today want a Christmas that is glamorous and glitzy. They want colored lights and they want tinsel on their trees. They want bright ribbons and colored packages. They want the things of this world in those packages. And maybe they want something that feels a little bit of religious to give them the atmosphere of Christmas, but they don't want the gift of Christmas itself. So we ask today, what do you want for Christmas? The people in Nazareth were unhappy with the Lord. They were unhappy with what he had to say. They became angry, in fact, and they thought to do him harm. They would not receive the clear preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the salvation of their souls. And they rejected the Lord and his word and came under the condemnation of God. For God comes at Christmas and God comes again at the end of time in salvation, forgiveness, joy, and peace. And he comes in judgment for those who will not hear his word. Today he says to you and I who are bound or were bound in the chains of sin, to those who are still bound in those chains, to those whose hearts are broken and downcast, he says, I have come to preach good news to you who are afflicted. I have come to bind up your heart, O oh, you who are broken in heart. He says, I am come to break your chains and release you from your dark prison cells that you might walk out freely into the light of God's love. To proclaim the year of jubilee in which everything goes back the way it was and all people are released and everything is restored in the name of the Lord. For this is the year of the Lord. This is the day of judgment of our God. God takes those things that are broken and in pain and sorrow and he mends them by the power of his word. He takes our broken and sinful lives and he restores them in his love. He says in verse 3, to bestow on those who grieve a crown of beauty. The imagery of a wreath put upon the head, which brings joy to the winner of a race, which brings authority to a king. He comes to bring you beauty instead of ashes. There is no longer any reason to be mourning in sackcloth and ash. There is no longer any need to despair and sorrow, for he brings you the oil of gladness instead of mourning. He pours it over your head, the fragrant oils filled with spices that give you that wonderful, wonderful aroma, pleasing to you and pleasing to God. 
You know this oil of gladness only appears one other place. That's in the Psalms, in a bridal psalm in which God speaks of his bride, the church, dressed and anointed and beautiful. And that's what we see as we move into the end of this psalm today, is the salvation and the joy that God has given you, has given you in his love. Because you are, it says here, oaks of righteous, a tenebreath of strength. A tenebreath is a tree. It's a strong tree, like an oak tree. It blossoms and round and is round, but it's an evergreen. It's like being an evergreen of long life, of strength and joy. What God has given to you and all those who believe in him through the gift of Jesus on the cross, the tree that stands at the beginning and end of time, the tree upon which our salvation was won, he has given you joy and happiness and long life and strength and power and forgiveness and peace and all of the things that he would have you to have to have you to have in Christ Jesus your Lord for the gift of Christmas brings to you abundant gifts and so we look at verse 10 and 11 as we now move from considering the Savior who comes, who came long ago, and who promises to come again, because here he talks about the church. Christ is always the bearer of salvation. Christ is always the one who brings redemption. But now the tone in 10 and 11 turn upon those who have been brought these marvelous gifts of God. And here in 10 and 11 it says, Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorn herself with jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up in a garden, causes seeds to grow. So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. And now we come to the bridal picture, don't we? Here we come to the bride of Christ and the bridegroom himself, who puts on his head the finest of linen turbans, adorns himself with a turban that resembles that of a priest, and he gathers to him his bride. But what does he do for her? He arrays her in garments. He places a mantle, a cloak, around her shoulders to enwrap her in beauty. And he puts the jewels of his means of grace upon her, that his church might shine and sparkle. He brings us beauty. He adorns his bride with heavenly splendor. And that bride is you. You are the bride of Christ. Now for us guys, that might be hard to imagine. But for you ladies that have been married, you know what it's like. All of the joy, all of the excitement. In fact, the scripture uses this imagery as the deepest, purest kind of joy. A sincere, heart felt love that comes as a response to what the bridegroom has done. And what has he done for you? What has he done for you? He has given you his richest and most beautiful gifts. He's given you gold instead of tinsel. He's given you the light of the world instead of little electric Christmas lights. He's given you the very best he has, his salvation, that you may be his forever. Through the gift of faith in the cross of Christ, our sins, which are so many, are washed away in the purest of water. <coughs> and we stand like the bride in the scripture today before our bridegroom, holy and pure and innocent. The virgin church of Christ, which he gathers to himself in heaven. 
as the bridegroom takes the bride and marches her in festal procession to the home he has prepared. Soon Christ will come again and he will gather us together adorned with the marks of his church, the word and sacrament, which bring faith and life and enable us to respond to him in joy. And he will gather us together, his forgiven children of God. And in the beauty of salvation, he will carry you and he will carry me into the glories of the eternal kingdom prepared by his father before the beginning of the world. Just as certainly as a seed planted in a garden, in the rich soil and the warm sunlight will sprout and grow, he tells us today, so certain is your salvation. Never doubt it. Never doubt it because it is already your possession. You are already his possession and you have eternal life right now, today. So, dear bride of Christ, rejoice. Rejoice in the gift of Christmas. Rejoice in the gifts that he brings you each day. And rejoice for he comes again in grace to bring you home to God. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand for a blessing. And now may the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you'd like to hear more on this topic or any other, please contact us or join us Sunday mornings for worship at 9 o'clock, Bible class at 10 30.